Good afternoon. I'm Jean Ammon, assistant to the provost, and on behalf of the office of the provost, I welcome you to this very special presentation this afternoon. Provost Vanderhill is out of town. He regrets that very much. And he wanted me to express our pleasure, really, in being able to introduce Dr. Littell to you. We are today in the Provost Lecture Series um, helping to offer this presentation in conjunction with the Department of Philosophy, the Religious Council, various campus religious groups, the Ben and Bessie Ziegler Foundation, and a number of interested persons. We are very pleased in our office to be part of this day of remembrance. Dr. Jones asked me if I would say a few words about the Provost Lecture Series, under whose auspices uh, this event is sponsored. In the last 10 years, the Provost Lecture Series has brought approximately 125 speakers to campus. We often uh, bring people that we have consciously said, this is a person who will enrich the learning experience of all of us. We know that a great deal of learning perhaps even more learning, takes place outside of the standard classroom. And we not only think of this as a learning experience for students, but for us as faculty and staff and administrators, this is the way we think. And we hope we continue to think and learn also. In the Provost Lecture Series, we often, uh, as an office, uh, the Provost and I think of speakers that we feel would enrich the campus community. And we will offer an annual series on some particular theme, such as the university and the environment, or the university and ethical issues. But I think what we have enjoyed the most were the events that we were in collaboration with other campus groups. We were helping them, either through money, monetary support, or uh, through a little added help with publicity, our moral support, whatever we could give to bring a particular speaker to the camp, university community. On this very important day of remembrance, we are pleased to, first of all, join with you in saying never again. Never again must the Holocaust happen. We must always remember the Holocaust and its victims. As the Office of the Provost, we also want to say that we think it is our responsibility to think about the role of the university in society. What role do we have in societal events? When do we need to speak up? Can we afford to think only of our own interests internally? And so on. These are very, very important questions, and we need to raise them again on this day of remembrance. And so to the Holocaust planning group, both students, adult sponsors, and advisors. I want to say thank you for your work in planning the events of today, including the interfaith uh, service tonight. And certainly, we thank you for including our office in this very, very important event. Now I would like to introduce to you Dr. George Jones, who is an assistant director of student activities. He works with our religious council and is uh, such an important part of our university community in many other ways as well. The uh, memorial service is at 7.30 tonight in the chapel of the First Presbyterian Church for those of you who would like to be a part of that uh, worship service. Uh, Dr. Littell will also be speaking at that, based primarily on his personal uh, experiences in Germany following uh, World War II. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, to one's colleagues uh, someone who is uh, both a personal friend, an outstanding scholar, and a scholar whose work has made a difference in uh, public affairs. Uh, Dr. Uh, Franklin uh, Littell. Um, area of specialization has been um, religion in American history. He has particularly uh, worked uh, on
American occupation in post-war Germany uh, for the decade of about 48 to 58. Um, previously, he had served on the campus of the University of Michigan as a uh, religious affairs officer working uh, on the university staff with the uh, student religious organizations and the campus ministers. And it was in this regard that I first came to know him as uh, someone who uh, had helped founded our national organization, the Association for the Coordination of University Religious Affairs, as it was called at that time. And someone, when I after I came here to Ball State in a similar kind of position, uh, looked to for counsel and advice. Uh, after Dr. Littell has uh, served in many capacities after his uh, experience in post-war Germany. Uh, he uh, was uh, a professor at the Chicago Theological Seminary where he taught church history. He was president of Iowa Wesleyan College, now University in Iowa. And then he went to Temple University where he was the founder of their Department of Religious Studies. Um, <clears throat> He, um, uh, and it was a Temple that where he developed uh, Holocaust studies as a field of uh, scholarship, <coughs> earning the uh, 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 name as the father of Holocaust uh, studies uh, in America. Uh, in Philadelphia, uh, he helped, he was a founder of the Anne Frank Institute. Uh, he was the co-founder and first chairman of the annual Scholars Conference on the Church Struggle and the Holocaust. I think you, they celebrated their what, 25th anniversary at Brigham Young University this year, hosted that um, annual Scholars uh, Conference. Um, he, uh, in the area of public affairs, he uh, uh, was a founding member by presidential appointment on the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Council. He was the first Christian appointed uh, by the Israeli cabinet to the International Council of Yad Vashem, the uh, Holocaust uh, Muse uh, Memorial in uh, Jerusalem. Um, he's had a uh, number, uh, numerous other uh, uh, interfaith uh, uh, groups that he has uh, been a part of. Uh, he is an author of over 275 articles and chapters and has written 23 books of his own. Uh, the one that I think has been used often in religious studies classes in the United States is a book called From Church State to, to Pluralism, which is a history of uh, religion in the United States. I'm happy to present uh, my friend, Franklin Lutet. Thank you very much for a very generous introduction. It's good to be here to see old friend and also to make some new friends. As um, Dean was uh, telling about learning experiences outside the classroom, I remembered one of the most critical learning experiences of my young life. Uh, students are always uh, not interested in Paleolithic times, but uh, let me tell you about something that happened to me when I was a student. It was in the spring of 1934, and I was in compulsory chapel, which was an ancient and honorable institution in our society, in uh, a little college out in Iowa. And I was sitting in the balcony, which was where the freshmen sat, so that the monitors could count carefully on the chart. And uh, there came as a speaker uh, to the college a man who told us that the house was on fire, that a madman had come to power in Germany, that he was... Uh, determined uh, to uh, make the country free of Jews and to destroy the Jews of Europe, that he was already uh, attacking and uh, putting in prison such Christians as stayed Christian, and he paced like 
a caged lion, which I can't do because of this thing. In those days, we didn't have this uh, interference of the live voice. But he paced back and forth across that platform. I never had seen anything like it. He was totally physically and spiritually involved in the message of crisis, which he was bringing to us. Now, we had uh, uh, preachers in Iowa. I'm a Methodist clergyman. My father went before me who spoke a sound biblical and Christian word, edifying discourse was their style. But I never had seen anyone who was so totally wrapped up physically as well as mentally and spiritually in what he was telling. Uh, some persons present will, re re will place the man. It was Elmer Homerickhausen who at that time was pastor of the First Reformed Church of Freeport, Illinois, later professor at uh, the School of Religion at Butler University, which later became Christian Theological Seminary, and then finishing his career at Princeton. I have never forgotten that man. And when I approach a subject such as, uh, as uh, Hashoah, such as the Holocaust, uh, I feel responsibility as a human person first, before I was ever an academic, uh, to bring to you as best I can a message which carries a note of crisis. That is a message which has uh, moral as well as intellectual significance in your experience. I hope some of you may be touched in that way. We're in a season when we are remembering, and we are remembering a watershed event in the history of Western civilization. Not something that happened just to the Jews. In fact, I would say it happened even more critically uh, to the society which called itself Christendom, in which the baptized and the perpetrators were, after all, baptized and never rebuked, uh, were Christians. Uh, my first credibility crisis, and the one to which I speak frequently, is the credibility crisis of Christianity. Uh, and I remember how the old rabbis uh, used to say that if the Gentiles had realized the significance of the destruction of the second temple they would have mourned it more than the Jews I thought of that often and it's true here was the center and the sign of a monotheistic faith a sign to the God who is God in the midst of a brutal lascivious corrupt empire and it wasn't just the Jews that suffered when the temple was destroyed and they were scattered, uh, even though most of the Gentiles were blind to the significance of it. And the Holocaust is not just something bad that happened to the Jews. It's something terrible that happened in the heart of Christendom. And the second credibility crisis, which I have been working on in these years, is the crisis in popular sovereignty. Our failure to understand, even in this country where we talk so much about liberty, that the will of the people is only 50% of our heritage. The other 50% is the secure guarantee of the dignity and the liberty and the integrity of the human person in ethnic, cultural, and religious minorities. It's not enough to say the people want this, the people want this. The question is whether there is also in it that respect for the human person and especially the poorest and the weakest in the society, which dignifies our heritage. And if you don't have that, 
uh, you don't have what we lightly call democracy. Democracy must have those two things. Never forget that. Uh, if it is true to uh, what our fathers believed fundamental and we are supposed to hold to. But you didn't ask me here to talk about those two things particularly. Maybe this evening I'll get a chance later to talk about the religious crisis as I see it. Uh, I have been invited to speak about something which is even more sensitive in a way, and that is the credibility crisis of the modern university. Because one who studies the Holocaust has to come to terms with the fact that the planning and supervision and operation and apologetic for it was an activity of professors and PhDs, not of course to forget the MDs. We like to uh, speak of it as so, though it was uh, a crime committed by a bunch of uh, savages off in the bush someplace, but it wasn't. Uh, the leaders in it who made it possible, who organized it, uh, were products of what were then world rank universities uh, before the Nazis ever got their hands on them and ruined some of them. you to think for the moment of uh, 1924, 25, 26, 27 uh, at uh, Heidelberg and Berlin and Göttingen and Tübingen and, and Marburg. All of them great world rank universities that turned out uh, Dr. Dr. Josef Mengele. He had two doctors. Please. Heidelberg in Berlin, and turned out Dr. Roland Freisler, who was the chief jurist in Hitler's hanging courts, and turned out, don't forget the theologians, Dr. Emanuel Hirsch, and Dr. Gerhard Kittel, and I could name 20 of them. So we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing or not doing in terms of uh, education in ethical values, in what the Germans call Berufsethik, in professional standards, uh, in the dignity of uh, one's stewardship of power, because educated people have power. They may look rather helpless sometimes, but it's an optical illusion. Educated people are stewards of the power centers in the society. Our alumni are the ones who keep the machines going in an advanced society. And so we are confronted with the question, what, do we, what are we turning out? Are we turning out people who are committed to life, and to what good Pope John the Twenty Third called in one of his great encyclicals the dignity, the integrity, the liberty of the human person, or are we turning out technically competent barbarians? So I drop that question unpleasantly in your lap, since I am bringing a note of crisis to us. Well, you think, after all, you know, things aren't that bad. <laughs> sure. I remember reading the uh, autobiography of Graf Fugger of Augsburg, who survived Hitler's time in exile. He was one of the lucky ones. He came from that great Catholic family uh, mostly in the banking business in Augsburg, uh, going back to the 14th century already. And he 
told uh, in his autobiography how in uh, the uh, spring of 1932, he was visiting a friend in Italy. And um, they went for a walk through the park. Europeans are all great at that. And uh, visiting. <laughs> and his friend kept complaining about Mussolini and his uh, dictatorship. Brutal, corrupt, so contemptuous of, of human beings. So after a while, I got tired of this, and I said to him in exasperation, why do you put up with it then? We Germans would never put up with something like that. And uh, then he said, I lived to learn what we Germans would put up with. Ten years later, Hitler and uh, his gang and all those hundreds of lawyers, hundreds of doctors, hundreds of business executives, and dozens of theologians and so on who found ways of waffling the truth and fitting in were making the most powerful killing machine that the world had seen to that point. I remember a scene at Hadamer, which was one of the killing centers for the euthanasia program. Many of the people who ran Auschwitz and Treblinka and Sobibor and the other killing centers for Jews had already been trained in the way you select out and the way you manage people so that they don't realize what's going to happen till the last minute and so on. And at Hadamar on this afternoon, a rather unusual event occurred in uh, the way Germans structure things, in those days at least. Uh, they had uh, an afternoon social with champagne and uh, the little cakes. And uh, they invited in. The nurses, the doctors did, that was a breakthrough in itself. And uh, they invited in the administrative personnel and even the cleaning staff to celebrate their 10,000th case of disposing of an unwanted person. It was all done very scientifically. It was all done well planned. It wasn't haphazard. It wasn't even mob action. Although in November of 1938, the Nazi party did uh, stir up the mobs and managed to get enough of them excited that they behaved the way mobs do broke store windows and stole things, and burnt some synagogues, and beat up and killed a few Jews on the street, and so forth. But that was all to give the appearance that all the German people wanted this uh, uh, kind of assertion of uh, German dumb. That was a fraud. Later, our study showed that at that time, over 80% of the German people were ashamed of what had happened to Kristallnacht. That's not, that's not, that's not honorable. That's not the way Germans should behave. It's not fitting. But of course by then, with the dictatorship fastened upon the country, uh, most of the people felt there was nothing, nothing they could do. The thing was already in the hands of people who know how to do things to do things with an ice cold objectivity, who, who wouldn't let themselves be deterred by any human touch, by any thing that diverted from rigid intellectual discipline and technical competence. There's a very interesting 
interesting uh, section in uh, Thomas Mann's uh, Dr. Faustus. In that story, the scientist is a musicologist, uh, Adrian Leverkuhn, his name. Uh, musicology is the science of music, in case you paused for a moment. He couldn't sing. And he couldn't play an instrument, but he was a scientist of music. And uh, he was walking with uh, Dr. Zeitblum, his reported uh, biographer, and asked the question, uh, do you know a passion more compelling than love? And uh, Zeitblom says, why, is there such a thing? And the scientist says, yes, curiosity. And Zeitblom says, uh, by that, I guess you mean a passion from which all animal warmth has been removed. And Labor Coon laughs and said, uh, I'll accept that uh, definition. A passion from which all animal warmth has been removed, which has that quality of ice cold objectivity and disregard for the human fact, for the human person. Himmler was uh, always proud of the number of doctors, PhDs, and MDs he had as officers in his death uh, uh, group. And the four Einsatzgruppen who killed a million and a quarter Jews by crude means, like machine guns and so on, before they even invented the, and set up the really efficient killing centers, three of the four at doctor's degrees. At the, at the Wannsee conference in January of 1942, where Heydrich uh, brought together representatives of all the major departments of the, of the Nazi, uh, the German government at that time, not to decide what was to be done, that had already been decided, but to do it with a maximum of efficiency, because when you have a really competent uh, bureaucratic structure, bureaus jostle and get in each other's ways, unless you get everything set up so the machine functions properly. And of the 14 who gathered on that day uh, to make the killing of maximum efficiency, Eleven had doctor's degrees. So I think I'm not entirely unjustified in saying there's a credibility crisis in higher education. And I'm not so naive, and I hope you aren't either, as to think, well, it was just something in Germany between 1920 and 1945. Because the Holocaust was a watershed event in Western civilization, in something that was called Christendom. And some people are still naive enough to call the European situation Christendom to this day. And it was something which revealed what well-trained and disciplined and ice cold people can do if they lose a measure of ethics, if they lose a sense of commitment to God and to each other. You think, well, what did they learn? Or maybe what didn't they learn? I remember uh, A.D. Lindsay, who was the master of Balliol, giving the Perry lectures at uh, Yale when I was there years ago now. And he told about um, a colleague who had said a real scientist would 
be as pleased to have invented a deadly poison, one drop of which in a city's water supply would kill millions, as he would be to discover the specific to rid the world of a deadly plague. You hear what he's saying? It is a real scientist. And then Lindsay, who was master of Balliol College in Oxford, said <clears throat> he wasn't a scientist at all, he was an economist. <laughs> Well, during the 10 years that I was in uh, post-war Germany, one of my privileges was to work and learning experiences was to work with leaders in the various sectors of an advanced society which had destroyed its honor and its dignity and which was trying to find its way back to self-respect of some kind or another. There are those who spoke of the German miracle, and I guess some of them still do, in economic terms. And of course, by now we Americans should have learned uh, something about the German miracle. I don't know what the exchange rate is now to the D-mark, but uh, no doubt about it, it's an economic miracle. But to me, the most amazing thing of all was that as a result of conferences held 365 days a year for 10 years, from 1945, October, clear through to May of 1955, roughly, it's good bracketing, those conference centers held meetings of surgeons, chiefs of police, um, shop foremen, elementary school teachers, all of the various people who do the specialized things which hold an advanced society together. Every one of them demoralized. I mean, the elementary teachers, the teachers were among the worst of the lot in terms of Nazi party membership and then prostituting their responsibility over young lives and spirits and getting hyped to serve the fear. And medics, we've already talked about them. And judges, we've mentioned them. All of these highly specialized groups that do the things that hold a modern society together. And there were two questions which they put to each other. I was in a position at that time to be able to finance things. The dollar was worth something overseas then and was able to work with them. And I have a whole library of reports from these conferences. And they asked two questions after the collapse, which some called liberation even in the early years, liberation from Hitlerism. One, where did we go wrong? At what point did our stewardship of power and of what we knew how to do take a turn toward murder and disaster? And the second question which they asked was equal uh, radicality, if you will, was uh, what is our responsibility now? When we are leaders in a distraught society, and when we first started, there were millions of people living in open fields and in bunkers and uh, doubled up in, in uh, crowded apartments and so on. What is our responsibility now? How do we get a society back on the track, away from dictatorship and toward integrity and self-respect? I think any society would do well to have a series of conversations.
conferences of that kind, taking up issues of professional ethics and morals. You know, our, our, our community, we no longer live in community in the primitive sense where the tribe or the clan, uh, the blood relationships are community. Uh, many of us don't even live in villages anymore where you know your neighbors. I grew up in a village. It's a long time since I've lived in one. I live in, an, uh, in a, a condo complex where I don't even know the names of the people, most of them. And I couldn't care less, I tell you frankly. I'm much more interested in uh, what some historian is doing in Ann Arbor or what some uh, theologian is doing in Cambridge, Massachusetts, or something. I mean, my community is a professional community. And if you look at any city of any size, you know, the taxi drivers know the taxi drivers. And the bankers know the bankers. And the specialists in other fields, they know each other. The cities are nowhere near as anonymous as they're sometimes made out to be. But we have a new principle of community. Surgeons know the surgeons. All you have to do is to go into a city full of hospitals and medical schools like Philadelphia, for example, and it's totally bewildering to somebody who isn't a doctor. But as soon as you talk with a member of your family or your family doctor about different, they know, they know each other. So that it is imperative that our, our structures of ethical discipline and of morality and of um, commitment to life itself should be rooted and grounded uh, in uh, our basic learning and our basic community. And if we don't have that, don't think people are going to do it through neighborliness. Uh, the TV evangelist may tell you that, but as on many things, they're kidding. All right? Either you get it or you don't. <laughs> Questions? Yes, sir. Give me one at a time. <laughs> well, uh, there were three Heidrich camps, so called. Yeah, the question was what about Soviet Boer, which was one of the killing centers? There were three Heydrich camps, so-called, which were set up as special camps under his supervision before the Czechs knocked him off. And and um, uh, there's a, a very good book about the the camps by Yitzhak Arad, A R A D. Now, why any one camp gets more uh, publicity than another, I suppose, depends upon who you are. Uh, the, the 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 Fourth Army, Russian, overran Auschwitz and the eastern camps, so that I'm sure in Russia, when you talk with veterans and so on, you're going to hear more about them. Americans had their first contact with, uh, with uh, Dachau and uh, Buchenwald, and then the British with Bergen-Belsen and Neuengamme and so on, so it really is, uh, there, were, there were several dozen major centers and, and many little outlying units attached to them. But if you want to know about Soviet Boy, there's a good book there by Iran. What's the second? The question is, what about uh, Bosnia? That is the ruins of Yugoslavia. Uh, the um, I, I think two things. One is, I don't think that the word Holocaust should be used so freely. Uh, it is, uh, uh, it refers now for all practical purposes to the Nazi genocide of the Jews. Uh, therefore, uh, I don't like uh, at all and write negatively in my reviews about uh, people who use Holocaust to cover, I even saw a headline uh, now two or three years ago about a baseball Holocaust. Uh, I think that we have to avoid using the word so freely, if you want to, uh, the Nazi genocide of the Jews was a, 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 this is a terrible way to put it, but what the sociologists call a model case of genocide. 
if you want to talk about genocide, then we can start with the Armenians at the turn of the century and work down through. Uh, however, not every mass murder or tribal conflict qualifies even as genocide. Genocide is now a crime. And if you have crime, you have criminals. That means that, that somebody plans it. Uh, you don't have uh, genocide when the Sioux Indians and the Crow Indians fight each other in earlier times. You have the way the heathen have behaved since the mind of man runs, <laughs> not to the contrary. Also the Franks and the Germans and the Poles and the Russians. And I think also the Hebrews and the Hellenes in ancient times. So you, I would like to say the first point would be to let's, let's be careful because it, if we, we're not, we're going to end up with the word Holocaust being like the word democracy, which we have to rehabilitate now, after all these people's democracies are beginning to collapse, which they deserve indeed, but which ruined the language for a while, so to speak. But now what about uh, the situation in what we call uh, uh, Bosnia? <clears throat> to give it a... a a, a, a perspective, historically. I am happy that everybody feels miserable about it. In dealing with what religionists like me call sins, if I may use that word, State University, <laughs> there were many things which were sins for a long time before the conscience of the society reached the point where it was recognized crime is involved. Before that, they were considered like earthquakes or floods or something. I mean, feuding, dueling, infanticide, the exposure of unwanted uh, older people. Some of us think of that with a certain sensitivity. <laughs> Slavery. There were a lot of things that were wrong for a long time before the society reached the point of saying, wait a minute, this is something which we can take hold of. It's a crime. And then you get laws, and there's a time gap before you say something's a crime, and you can enforce the penalties which inhibit people thinking about doing the same thing. Now, that's where we are with genocide. We now know that genocide is a crime. We have an international convention since 1951 on the subject, which the United States finally got around to signing. And we're in that time lag between the point when it's a crime and the point when we can really do something about it. Now, some things are beginning to be done, but we lack, uh, uh, so far, powerful enough instruments and agreement among those who have the power to do something uh, to, to uh, be effective. There's a court working in The Hague in the Netherlands right now with names of war criminals. And the day will come for sure uh, when that will no longer be just the hope that in due season there will be an in inhibition against uh, military commanders. I mean, I, I say any military commander, I don't know who he is, who targets civilian targets is a criminal. And, uh, I mean, you know, we've got, to, we've got to get clear on a lot of points. It's not soldiers in uniform who die in modern wars. It's civilians. It's much safer to be in uniform. That was true even in the First World War. Overwhelmingly true in the Second World War. And true even in this clan fighting that's going on in the primitive uh, circumstances in Bosnia. So I think we've got to stake out a few uh, you know, basic principles. And one of them is encouraging. A hundred years ago, you could have had this tragedy, and everybody would say, well, that's the world for you. Two hundred years ago, they wouldn't even have talked about it. Now everybody feels miserable, and I think that's a good sign. 
Yes, sir. Either yesterday before you have the end of the paper, I read a pretty long article about yet another story of the main hitman. Uh, uh, are you familiar with it? Do you have a story about where he actually got out? Oh, well, there's a, there's a, a scholar down at, uh, at the University of South Carolina named, named uh, Herstein who has written two or three books in this issue, that is, uh, The Myth of, um, of uh, Hitler's Survival. Uh, Hitler committed suicide, and uh, uh, they tried to dispose of the remains uh, at the bunker on the Wilhelmstrasse in Berlin. I think that's all been established pretty clearly now uh, uh, by the Russians and the Americans and the other super specialists in that particular area. And the suicide was appropriate. Do you see the reflection of uh, the Congress, the way they're uh, taking on the welfare and trying to get rid of it, as maybe a new form of American Nazism against the poor to cut the Nazi Well, the question is whether the contract on America is a form of Nazism. <laughs> If I were writing an editorial for a student paper, I might let her fly. Uh, but, but, but I don't think it would be wise in a discussion where we're trying to make some distinctions uh, to, um, uh, to uh, pursue that logic. I think it's much more a reflection of belated American isolationism and resentment of years when we seem to be carrying the world's burdens. It's also, of course, a racist uh, flashback. We mustn't forget that. You check where it's coming from and the circumstances. The people who don't are not bold enough to come right forward to say what they mean, uh, but uh, they resent equal opportunity and affirmative action and so forth. Yes, sir. Mike, do you comment a little bit about the role that the major religious organizations in Germany had that encouraged or somehow uh, serves a platform for the Holocaust, namely the Roman Catholic Church and the Lutheran Evangelical Reform Churches? I think you all heard that question on the role of the churches in uh, uh, relationship to Nazism. Now, this is a very important and very difficult question because it also involves the period before the rise of Nazism. Uh, I will say that uh, that one of the greatest weaknesses of uh, Christian teaching over a long period of time is that we have not had a, an adequate uh, body of material as to the time and circumstances in which it is the responsibility of a Christian man or a woman to say no. We have a vast library on the virtue of uh, obedience. Obedience to authority, clerical, political, but we have very, very little in the way of uh, the time and place of uh, conscientious objection. The result is that very great and good men and we just had the 50th anniversary of the martyrdom of uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, for example. Uh, but like Bonhoeffer, and like Father Delt, the Jesuit, and uh, others, uh, didn't have the intellectual weapons, so to speak, uh, to go into the battle with uh, a murderous state, so that they were better in their testimonies than their theology was. They didn't have the, the equipment. And that's a fault of the churches. We have to uh, have to work on that. And uh, not life, I mean, so any time you don't like what the government does, that's the time to run up the flag of rebellion. That's nonsense. But uh, it's also nonsense to say, as the churches did when they got into the Hitler period, so that even a, a saintly a peasant like Franz Jägerstetter, who was done to death because he wouldn't put on the uniform and fight for Hitler, Catholic from the Tyrol, uh, uh, was advised by his priest and his bishop that he ought to. He owed the 
as a Christian, you owe the obligation to the, to, to the leader. Uh, uh, so I think we have to work on that body of doctrine and teaching uh, to draw the lines at the right place and to help people who have uh, legitimate grounds for being conscientious objectors. The other, of course, is in the whole field of Christian-Jewish relations, where ever since the third and fourth century, we've been teaching uh, contempt and defamation, uh, sometimes subtly and sometimes openly, of the Jewish people. And that won't do anymore. And the best, uh, the, 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 the most exciting front line in Christian theology today in Germany, in Holland, and in the United States, and also in Canada, is on Christian Jewish relations. And there are some, there's some very good work being done in that area. So, yeah. Yeah, you'll have to speak louder because. Did you say 80% of the Germans were against um, Hitler? Um, I said, I, uh, now, Kristallnacht is a term which is applied to uh, an outbreak of mob violence, which even at the time, uh, uh, canny observers knew to be instigated by the Nazi party in the Gauleiter. Uh, November 9, 10, and 11, 1938. At the time, Hitler was trying to show the world, all of my people, you know, I express the will of the people. That's the point I was making very early. Every dictator in the 20th century claims to express the will of the people. Uh, but uh, we have studies now, very careful studies, uh, based on the Lagerberichte, as they're called, which was the internal spy reports, which we have which shows that 80-something uh, percent of the, of the German people were ashamed. They said, this is un-German. This is, this is, uh, so it wasn't uh, uh, what Hitler was, in one of his typical lies, trying to make it out to be. Were these people outside the military? These were, these were people outside the military. So the, 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 this is a very interesting point. The lie in every ward in Germany and every village, there were spies, people in place to report on how, uh, on any people who said things which sounded disloyal, but also to report uh, uh, cold-bloodedly on anything which uh, 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 needed to be known up front. And they had specific instructions not to doctor their reports. I mean, if some party official made a fool of himself and the people said so, they were to report it, you see. Just the way it was. And we now have those longer be uh, from all over Germany. And they give you the best indication there is as to how the people reacted to various measures and actions uh, of the government uh, at that time. And as far, as far as the mob violence against the Jews is concerned, it's very clear. But what do you do? That's the tragedy of the modern period. We have to disabuse ourselves with the thought of the thought that the mob's going to storm the Bastille. It doesn't mean a thing in modern technology. A small number of people as we found out at the time of the June 17, 1953 revolt in East Germany, or of the, uh, when the youngsters in Hungary revolted, 100,000 of them, November, no, October 26, November 7, 1956, a small number of people controlling the instruments of communication and with mass firepower uh, can, can uh, uh, keep even soldiers with rifles, uh, automatic attack. Under, put them under control again. You, you, once you get a dictatorship in place in the modern period, there's not going to be any uh, of the kind of uh, popular overthrow, which uh, has been one of the staples of the American myth. <laughs> yeah, you have another one. I can't hear you. You'll have to speak what up. What I'm trying to ask you, you said that 80% of the Germans were ashamed of, of the Nazis against the Jews. Well, I'm asking you, the military worked, even though Hitler wasn't Jewish, I assume, his, his, um, his, his people that he got to um, carry out the gas chambers and killings were they Germans. Well, that's what I'm asking. They, they, 
They were German, Ukrainian, Latvian, Lithuanian, Poles, mostly the first ones that I've named. The, uh, the, uh, but this was, uh, I didn't say that the people were, ash were uh, ashamed of what he did uh, uh, toward the Jews. I said that, and Kristallnacht, specifically, November 9, 10, 11, 1938, 80-something percent indicated that they thought this mob violence was un-German and shameful. Uh, I don't remember, uh, if I ever did know, what the, uh, their reaction might have been if they had known about the rejection of the ship St. Louis by uh, the United States and other powers who refused to give haven uh, to Jewish refugees. They undoubtedly heard about it because Hitler boasted, said, see, that's the way the world feels about the Jews. We don't want them either. And they don't want them. Hmm? Uh, how did they feel about that? That's something I should uh, get busy and read up on. But the point is the official, uh, the, the, uh, Goebbels, who was the uh, most skillful manipulator of public opinion probably in the 20th century, and thank God he didn't have TV to work with, only radio. Uh, um, and what he was doing and what the real facts of the case were, two different things. <laughs> it's, it's, and we can prove it now. We sensed it, but it's evident. The documents are clear on it. Well, Sullivan's all parallels between what happened in uh, educated Germany during World War II and what's happening today in educated America. Sullivan talks about that in abortion. You know, I, you, have to, I, you have to speak up. I can't hear you. Well, I think it's legitimate to raise the question about the morality or immorality of uh, abortion. It's also legitimate to raise the question of how you're going to handle it and who makes the decisions and so forth. I would like to have the thing discussed with less uh, flag waving, I mean banner waving, not flag waving, uh, and more uh, a sense of political reality uh, and uh, morality. A colleague of mine, lifetime friend, uh, George Williams at Harvard, uh, wrote an article uh, which he, in which he refers to the sacred condominium of decision. There are issues which should not be left to the medical doctor. And so he's a mechanic and it doesn't make any difference anyway. There are decisions which not, should not be left to, in this case, the woman. Uh, uh, who will be burdened as an individual uh, for the rest of her life with some memories. Uh, it is a situation in his judgment where a uh, doctor, rabbi, priest, or minister, uh, spouse, and the individual concerned, those four uh, should enter into a faithful and deep uh, discussion uh, toward a decision. And he doesn't take the position of absolute uh, uh, opposition, and I don't either. Uh, but I do take uh, the position that it is not just a mechanical issue. Any others? Yes, sir. Why should anybody look at the contemporary American university feel that it's any less morally vacuous than the German universities of the 20s and 30s. Um, the fact is, is that law schools and business schools have these exhortations to students to attend to ethics that, that amount to little more than telling them to pull up their socks. Medical students, to the extent that they have any courses in medical ethics, it really boils down to here are the things you should not do because some lawyer will see your pants off Heidegger is taught in philosophy departments without any mention of his being the chancellor of the University of Berlin, a position he only resigned from, not because of the atrocities of the Nazis, but because by the fact they were losing the war, proved that they weren't Heideggerian anymore. Eliade is taught without any mention of the fact that he wrote racist propaganda for the Romanian uh, Black Guard during the war. And I guess I'm at, at the, at the, at the uh, 
the turn, well, uh, at the turn of the century, yeah, university yeah, yeah, presidents yeah. used to give courses to seniors in moral philosophy as though that were part of their responsibility. And of course, none of that happens today. So why should anybody believe that this is somehow a morally better place than uh, the German forebears of the American Union? Uh, you said it. <laughs> you, you're, you're, you're putting into uh, more or less summary form uh, what I would prefer to toss out as a, uh, a smoking bomb so that everybody has to think about it. We thank you, Dr. Littell. If some of you have uh, personal questions or private questions you want to ask Dr.